So last year, I set off on this ridiculous journey. <coughs> Traveling the length of the UK to get to the next major climate conference in Glasgow. Along the way, I met and connected with people all around the world. It really inspires me seeing your work. And perhaps some of the most memorable experiences were meeting young people who were taking matters into their own hands. It starts with empowering people with education. The thing that stood out for me the most was this overwhelming sense of fear and anxiety for what happens if the world doesn't take action in time. The feeling of powerlessness in the face of environmental catastrophe. With climate disasters increasingly appearing in the media and this seemingly never-ending barrage of negative news, I'm starting to wonder how all of this is impacting our mental health. It's really scary. I cannot explain how I feel. And more and more people are starting to speak about this. There's this massive force coming towards you. Young people have to be the voice. About the link between the climate crisis and mental health. And they're calling it climate anxiety. When I think about it, climate anxiety is something that I've experienced. This confusing and often overwhelming concoction of emotions. Fear, grief, anxiety, shame, and guilt. And so I want to go on this journey to understand exactly what climate anxiety is and what can be done to help people who are experiencing it. And I guess I also have this one like overriding question of, is this a bad thing? Or is it, in fact, a sane reaction to an increasingly crazy world? Climate anxiety feels like a lot of things. I am flooded with all these emotions. Panic. Guilt. Stress. A bit scared. Sad. With helplessness. Anger. Frustrated. Trapped. Feeling that I'm not doing enough. Very much powerless. Heartbroken. I can't breathe anymore. It's going to be too late for us. There is no hope. As soon as I began looking into climate anxiety, everyone kept pointing me towards this major scientific study. Growing scientific climate change. Action is needed now. Climate anxiety. The reality of climate change is finally hitting home. Children started telling us that they were feeling betrayed and abandoned. The children are frightened because they're seeing the Amazon burning. They're seeing floods in Germany, hailstorms in Spain. The author of that study, psychotherapist Caroline Hickman from the University of Bath, has come to meet me at our production office. I'm Rowan. Hey. Could you just take your highlight to the picture place? Your research, you've spoken to people, young people all around the world. How would you define the way it is affecting our mindsets? So climate anxiety is the really emotionally healthy, congruent, understandable response that we start to feel as we become aware, as we start to wake up to what's going on in the world. What we hadn't quite anticipated was the number of children and young people who felt that humanity was doomed, the number of children and young people globally who said they were not going to have children or they were hesitant to have children. I had no idea about the scale of the sense of betrayal from government because I'd not measured that before, so we were able to measure it this time. Caroline's work revealed what a huge issue this is for young people. What do we want? She found that over half of young people globally think that humanity is doomed. I wanted to hear about that reality from someone who speaks directly with thousands of young people and teachers. Environmental disaster is the biggest mental health issue of our lifetimes. And in our war against nature, young minds are the collateral damage. Clover Hogan witnessed the effects of climate change firsthand whilst growing up in Australia and Indonesia. She now lives down the street from me. Clover, you've been in the climate space for, for many years. And as I've told you a million times, I'm a huge fan of, of your work. And, and I particularly love 
force of nature and, and the work you do through that. But I'm curious, I've never taken the time to ask what, what inspired you to start that in the first place? Like, what did that journey look like? I was in an environmental studies class and my teacher introduced me to this word called ecophobia. And he defined it as the feeling of powerlessness in the face of environmental catastrophe. And it was like this light bulb moment because I felt for the first time, okay, I'm not alone. <laughs> like other people feel this way. Mm. And so it was born from that place really of how do we empower people to step up rather than shut down in the face of a climate crisis. I feel like I'm starting to get a better sense of the, the scale of this thing, but I still feel very confused as to like what can be done about it or what even should be done about it. And maybe like what's missing? Like what, what do young people need in order to better process these feelings? You kind of trust the adults in your life, be they your parents or your teachers, to tell you how the world works and to prepare you for the future. Mm. And we're doing a terrible job at preparing young people for the future. You know, even in the UK, climate change is not taught enough. It's not, this is the biggest challenge I've ever faced by yeah. humanity and here's what you need to do to be part of the solution. So naturally those conversations are gonna come up in classrooms. And the worst thing that we can do is try to shut them down. The most important thing that we can do is equip educators and equip young people, students, with the tools to have those intergenerational conversations. Wow. And so they've Viking. had so Teachers many. are clearly the key to this. So I headed to Westminster, to where the key decisions on education are made, to find out why our curriculum isn't changing as fast as the climate. So we're in the Department of Education this morning to meet Nadim Zahawi. Education, it's such a big nebulous thing. How do we change the education system? But this is the heart of it. It's where all the decisions are made. I was going to say have a seat, but that feels weird because this is your <laughs> office. So thank you for having me in your Welcome. office. Thank you so much. I think educators have a really challenging task on their hands. And on the one hand, they have to prepare young people for devastating climate breakdown, which is a very challenging thing to do. But at the same time, look after young people's resilience and mental health. And do you think that uh, we're doing enough to equip teachers with those skills? Does more need to be done? Be before you can do something, you have to actually recognize it's an issue. We know it's an issue. The way you deal with it, I think, is there are several strategies. One is obviously education, curriculum. That's exactly why um, we announced the sort of additional resources. Um, and what does that to look make like? Sure. What so, are those resources so, so basically, so we're helping create products that allow teachers to have um, the tools to be able to deliver high quality climate education. I mean, do you think young people are right to feel anxious about the climate crisis? Absolutely right to feel anxious because they have a body of evidence demonstrating that it's there. The concern or the anxiety comes from a, uh, in anything, right, is a lack of agency. Yeah, my pleasure. It's a huge responsibility on teachers to, to handle this crisis, to, to educate children on the reality of this crisis, but also to support them with their mental health, and they need more support. You know, teachers can have a profound impact on young people. I had an amazing teacher when I was at school, and she, she believed in me, and she, she gave me the time of day, and that it changed my life, you know, and, and the same can happen here, but, but teachers need to be given the support to do that. They need to be given the space, the materials, and the time. Whilst I did feel Nadim understood the importance of transforming our education system to reflect the climate emergency, I still think things aren't moving fast enough, given the scale of the mental health crisis engulfing young people today. But there is hope. I'm heading to Wales to meet an amazing teacher who's telling young people the truth about climate change while still managing to protect their mental health. Look at that. We've arrived in Wales. Smell of fresh air, faint smell of sheep poo, and amazing views. <sighs> Actually, I can sneak into the field. Is that allowed in Wales? Freedom! Wales! 
Now I've got that out of my system, it's time to go to school. Shelly Tokar and her junior class are letting me join in for the day. And it always makes me feel a bit nervous coming back to school. I don't know why. Oh, right, everyone. Hello. Come in, Jack. Thank Hello. you so much. This is Jack, Jack, everyone. He's come to spend the morning with us Hi. and to um, have Hello. a chat with you about <laughs> the climate and climate anxiety and all kinds of interesting things. So welcome, Jack. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. How are you guys doing? Good. Are you all right? A bit unusual to have cameras in the classroom, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. I miss the excitement of being in school. First of all, climate anxiety. How does it feel? Go on, Geffen. It feels like something inside you just can't get rid of. Yeah, absolutely, Caitlin. It makes you feel very depressed, like you have like a weight inside of you that you can't like get off your shoulders. Something deep in yourself that you can't get out. Uh, it makes have... people feel small. Makes people feel small. OK, but what do we say? Lots of s'mores? Make a big! This is an amazing way of teaching. The kids are not only learning about climate change, but also sharing and understanding their feelings. Now, when you plant your tree, you will get your hands dirty, OK? Ugh. It's quite hard work, this. Yeah. Can you tell that I'm from the city? The kids are practising mindfulness and then getting hands-on involvement in solutions. It helps them get everything into perspective. And me, not so much. Oh, look, there's a worm, look. look. Oh, I can't do it. I'm too much of a Londoner. It's just a worm, Shelley, nothing to worry about. It's just a really big one. You want to give it a name? Um, Bob. Bob the, Bob the worm. <laughs> I like that. All right, Bob, you're coming over here. I loved today. It was a real treat for me to, obviously, to meet the kids, but also to watch you teaching them and talking to them. And I just, I wanted to tell you that I was full of admiration for what you're doing. That's lovely. Thank yeah. you, Jack. That's really nice feedback. You know, I've been teaching for nearly 30 years and I've never felt such a heavy sense of responsibility as I do now. You know, that we, we give all this information to the children. I mean, even, even down to the, the children that are in, in the infants, six and seven year olds, we're still kind of like building this concern, you know, that like the end of the world is nigh. And then we walk away and we leave them with it. I think it's only because I use yoga and I use mindfulness um, to maybe distract the children and put them in a more positive place. Um, they're just tools that I naturally use, but I don't think generally the teaching profession have, have a, a bank of tools that they can use like that, you know? I absolutely loved meeting Shelley today. What an amazing, remarkable woman. And it's, it's given me a new found respect for the challenging job that teachers have communicating this issue to young people. And it's also got me wondering if there's something that we can do to help and the thing that stands out to me the most is what makes it worse is the idea that you're the only one experiencing it. And of course, what we're learning is that young people around the world are experiencing the same thing. And so I'm wondering if we can cut that into something, some sort of educational resource that we can give to teachers to help young people understand that they're not alone. It's amazing to see kids so openly and articulately sharing their feelings. They are so clearly benefiting from realising at such a young age how normal it is to feel like this, even in the UK. But what about young people living in places that are already being hit hard by climate impacts? In Caroline's study, the young people in the Philippines had amongst the highest level of climate anxiety in the world. And it's hardly surprising. I connected with an inspiring activist, Mitzi, whose community is being hit by climate fueled typhoons. In the past 20 years, the Philippines has had the highest number of extreme weather events across the globe. The three strongest storm landfalls in recorded history all happened in the Philippines. I grew up being afraid of drowning in my own bedroom. My parents, they say that it wasn't like this before. They didn't have that fear. They joke that 
they taught me how to swim so that if there's a flood, I know how to survive. That's how ingrained the climate crisis is in our culture at this point. We've experienced several, maybe around 10 once-in-a-lifetime typhoons here in the Philippines. The typhoons are getting stronger and more intense and more frequent, making things worse for everyday people. December 2021, a super typhoon hit the Philippines. Charlotte was right there as the wind picked up and the waves began to smash. You know, when you hear all the wind whistling, the glass starts to break and then all the kids cry. Everyone was screaming. Most of the people are like praying for their lives. I was like, oh my God, this is really serious. Like, how long it's gonna take? Like, are we gonna die? It's just scary, it's really scary. Like, I don't know, I cannot explain how I feel. Of course, there's some people who evacuated and then left their families. So they wanted to go out. And then after 30 minutes, they came back and they, they were crying. And he said like, oh, um, I couldn't find my family. I couldn't find my parents. Like, like we couldn't even ask like, are they okay? Like, are, did they, are they dead? You know, it was like crying like non-stop crying until 10 p.m. until we fell asleep. The next day, that was one of the best sunrise I've ever seen in my life. Like, I'm so happy to be alive. And then we saw friends, we saw people. How are you? How are they? Everything was fine and everyone was alive. And then, like, that's where you can tell that you really need to take care of other people. You need to say, I love you before everything goes wrong. You need to say whatever you feel. That's the thing about Filipino resilience. You know, if there are typhoons and you're flooding and you're seeing people stranded on rooftops, you'll always still see someone smiling and waving at the camera. Filipinos are so hopeful. And I think it stems from this place where we know that our community, the people around us are here to help. One amazing example of their determination to protect the youngest children's mental health was how the community responded to the library being destroyed by the typhoon. Since this library is for the kids, they tried to fix it within one month. So this library serves as like a safe haven for the kids. Some of the people's houses and the kids um, lost their homes and we really needed a space for them to find a shelter and a space for them to feel safe and also somehow we can ease the recovery of the psychological trauma that the typhoon has made. Saving places like the library helps the children's climate anxiety by providing respite from the destruction. It also gives a reassuring sense of normality, a place where the kids can be kids. But these amazing acts of resilience have a downside. The resilience of our communities and our individuals is becoming a scapegoat and an excuse for the national government to leave behind Filipinos and say, oh, you guys are so resilient, you're doing great, keep doing what you're doing, keep being strong, without actually making proactive efforts to make sure that we don't have to experience these things. And there's this concept in the Philippines where mental health is still a taboo. Anxiety and depression and all of these things aren't talked about enough and there's a lot that needs to be done to make sure that we can move forward from this. And it starts with empowering people with education. The ocean and its destructive power can be a cause for anxiety. But at the same time, for some, a beacon of hope. Although at first Charlotte was afraid of the water, she now finds solace and mental strength in it. You know, people find surfing as fun, but for me, I find it like I really needed to forget everything. I wanted to be in another world. My first wave, it was the best wave I've ever had in my entire life. That it feels so good that I was like, oh, okay, this is life. I still have hope. There's still hope for Chagall.
One of the things that I find the most discombobbling about this issue, you read so much of this devastating news, but then you go outside and it's like this, and it's a sunny day and you're in a park and everyone's just living their life normally and it's like this complete disconnect between what you're reading and learning and what you know also instinctively and then what you're seeing on a daily basis. Yeah. Is it important to make a distinction between the climate grief felt by those who live in the global north and those who live in the global south? And like, how, do you, how do you make that distinction? I remember my friends in places like Kenya and the Philippines who are already living through the climate crisis and for whom feeling anxiety and taking action, they don't have the privilege of choice, mm. right? Mm. Whereas I do. Mm. You can and walk around, you can just forget about it. Absolutely. Yeah. And so it's in those moments remembering that there are people who show up every single day because they have no alternative. Yeah. For me, that's the thing that drives that determination mm. and that pushes me and motivates me. For the first time, I've grasped just how massive the issue of climate change and mental health is, and how many other young people feel the same way I do. Which is why it makes it all the more frustrating when I hear it dismissed as another example of the snowflake generation getting all worked up. In fact, this generation is having an outbreak of reason in response to climate change. One member of this generation who has a particularly clear-eyed and even optimistic response to climate anxiety is actor and UN environmental ambassador, Aidan Gallagher. Gotta get the framing just right. <laughs> Let me know when we're rolling. Oh, we're rolling. Oh, yeah? <laughs> the bloopers of this will be online. Hey, Aidan, how's it going? Very good, how are you? I'm good, man, good to see you. Likewise. You ever see Interstellar? You know that scene where there's a giant tidal wave hurling towards them? That's what I think about when I think about like climate anxiety. That's how it feels. And you're this small thing, and there's this massive force coming towards you, and it's very real. That's not how I think about the climate crisis, because in that, in that metaphor, in that way of thinking, uh, there is nothing you can do. And that's not the case, you know? Although we are each individual's it is not something that we are alone in. We are all fighting it and feeling that anxiety together. And if we go through it in the right way, we could be on the sustainability revolution. Seriously, this shared climate anxiety by my generation, that is gonna be a massive force of willpower to push us in a positive direction. Powerful words, I agree with you on, on all of that. I think the thing that makes climate anxiety worse is the feeling that you're the only one experiencing it. Yeah, it's very useful to have a support group and someone to talk to. Aiden's right. In many ways, this is a, a sane and rational response to what's happening in the world. And perhaps in some ways, it can be useful. As more and more of us feel the impacts of climate change firsthand, we're faced with a choice carry on ignoring the mental health crisis that accompanies the more visible climate impacts. Or we can choose to help people who are experiencing these feelings. Firstly, just sit with them, process them, and maybe potentially turn them somehow into action. In the next episode, I want to experience some of the approaches people have found to help them deal with climate anxiety from the positive role of grief, to working out how to turn my own anxiety into action. I feel more nervous doing this stuff than I do interviewing Obama. Ah, snow angel. <laughs>